to to be here. You know, one of the truths in God's word is that He tells us, He says, "Don't go, you know, give up meeting together or get into the habit uh, of not meeting together." And you know, we've got to value really fellowship with each other, but really encountering the presence of God. And sometimes I think when people don't meet together, it's because they don't value what they've got. They only have to value it when it's taken away from them. But God wants us to value the things that he's given us and use the opportunities that we have to meet together, share the word of God, and be encouraged and, and built up in the things of God. You know, the Bible actually tells us that two are better than one. We give a greater increase. And so two are better than one. We help each other. One falls down. The other one can lift them up. So we encourage each other, we build each other up in the things of God. So it's always important to meet together, gather around his word, and listen to what God is saying. We're going to read from Matthew chapter 24. We looked at this passage last week. We're going to read a different scripture to you. And verse 14, it says this, And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So there's going to be a proclaiming of God's word. I don't know if you've ever considered this or not, but according to the scripture that we've read tonight, one of the signs prior to the end of the age is that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to them. And then the Bible says the end will come. So there's going to be an end time like revival that's still going to come. Now the word testimony, as used here, indicates a statement of truth. It's not testifying to uh, something that the Lord has done for a person. It's a statement of truth. It's a declaration of truth. And the gospel of the kingdom being preached is also speaking that there's going to be a generation of people that will rise up carrying the authentic message of the tremendous hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this message will be backed up not just with power, with signs and wonders, but I believe it will be backed up with a lifestyle, a lifestyle that honours the Lord Jesus Christ. God is concerned with your character right now. God is concerned with your life, how your life represents him. And God isn't looking for the power of signs and wonders. He's looking really for the fruit that is in a person's life, the character of Jesus Christ. But this end time group of people that will rise up, they're going to have a lifestyle that brings honour to the Lord Jesus Christ and makes then the kingdom of God <coughs> attractive to people around them. And God wants the kingdom to be attractive to him. You see, even the word kingdom actually means king, the king's domain. And so, really, it's telling us or talking to us about a time when the dominion of Jesus is brought into every situation and every circumstance you encounter. And we can start to live within kingdom now, where we do those sort of things. He's talking about a time when it's like King Jesus comes to enforce his will. So every time you pray, you pray in the name of Jesus Christ. It's as if Jesus Christ himself is there praying for you. Every time you lay hands upon a person, it's like Jesus Christ himself is laying hands upon that person. He's just simply using you as that channel, using you as that extension to reach to them. And we've got to have Jesus in the presence of everything that we do. But I believe it's also starting to move where we're starting to see certain things change, certain things shift. They're taking place today. And I believe that we're coming to, if you like, the end of a, a church age and really the beginnings of a kingdom age where we move into kingdom life. You know, if you think about the prophet Elijah, he actually said to Elijah, he says that before I go, what can I do for you? And he, he was talking to him about releasing a blessing into his life. Now Elijah said, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah said, you have asked a difficult thing, not something that was impossible, but something that was difficult. He said, yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, then it will be yours otherwise not. So depending on seeing the move of the supernatural that was going to take place for him to receive it. And this truth is that you have to see the end of an era before you can actually 
embrace or take hold of a new one. And God wants us to see the end of an era to embrace the new, the new of God. And God is doing the new thing. The new is often something that we've never experienced before, we've never seen before. The new can be something that we've not heard of before. We sometimes think that God is doing a new thing because it's just new to us. But God wants things to be new to his entire church, where they embrace the new of God, things that they've got no record of at all. In fact, when you read through the word of God, in Isaiah the chapter 48, he talks about this in verse 6. He says, From now on I will tell you of new things, of hidden things unknown to you. They were created now and not long ago. When were they created for that now moment for what you were doing? They were created now and not long ago. So that you cannot say, yes, I knew of them. He said, you have neither heard nor understood. So the brand new things, and God wants to do new things in your life and in your experience of him. So that your experience, things you've never seen before, never encountered before, never comprehend before, it's all new. And God wants to do this in our life. And I believe that part of the new that God is bringing is new levels of healing and the miraculous. Listen, it's one thing to see somebody healed of something minor. We praise God for all that. But if we start to see people healed on a level where it's major things, where it's things that medical science can't cure, can't comprehend, where those people have returned to their families and their neighbours, and they're completely healed, people are going to start to take notice that these people are healed, these people are restored, and yet they've been in that condition for many, many years. I believe the new that God is bringing, that kingdom age, is to bring new levels of healing, new levels of deliverance into people's lives, so where they're off the scale. There'll be journeys that God has booked for you, that you've never planned, to places that you've never been. And God wants you to encounter the supernatural of God. Listen, there are many people that are almost like have an adventure within them, an adventurous spirit. They like to do things, climb mountains, do things that other people wouldn't normally do. But yet God wants you to have an adventure in him, which is far greater, to encounter things, to go to places that other people would go, not go, to experience things that other people would not experience, to step into places where no one has stood. God wants those, those things to happen to you, for you to encounter them. But you're gonna be willing to step into the new, to leave the old, to embrace the new. It's just like, have you ever bought something new to replace something old? You look at the old and you think, well, I'll continue to wear that for the time being until it's worn out. And you know, the new can be hung, hung up in your wardrobe for another 12 months. We don't often put on the new the way that we should. And God wants us to put on the new. There are exciting times ahead, I believe, for those that would embrace the new of his kingdom and want to live that life that others have never experienced. If you think of the disciples, they started to experience the new of the kingdom because there was a period of time for over 400 years when it appeared that nothing was happening in the nation of Israel. But yet when Jesus Christ turns up, when Jesus Christ starts to empower and send disciples out in his name and his authority, things start to happen. So the ordinary person is encountering the supernatural. The disciples started to see things in the supernatural that the Pharisees, the leaders of that nation, had never encountered, never seen, never desired. But yet the disciples did, because he was willing to leave their own life to embrace the new life that Jesus had. And that's key, that you could be willing to leave the old to embrace the new. So there is exciting times ahead. Father desires that we long for more than we have right now, more than we've seen, more than we've experienced, just like Elijah. 
Elijah had seen Elijah do many miracles. He was his apprentice, he was with him. They would have talked about the things of God. But he wanted more. And God wants us to experience that. <clears throat> Listen, a number of weeks ago I quoted this scripture from Zechariah 10 and verse 1. And he says, As for rain in the days of the latter rain. And I believe this is because sometimes as Christians we believe we're living in all that there is. We've got it all. This is all we're ever going to experience. And yet God is saying, even though you're experiencing great things, salvations, healings, deliverance, supernatural encounters, visitations, you could be experiencing all those things, but yet God is still saying, ask for more. That's not being greedy. That's being obedient to what God wants. God likes and loves those that have a hungry appetite for him. And so he wants us to seek more. Think of what the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 13. He says, to him that has more, to him that has, more will be given. So the person that's got a lot is saying more will be given because they're desiring more. So it's God's great desire that you have more than you're experiencing right now. More than you've ever asked for. We need to ask for the more of God, a bigger portion. This is exactly what Elijah asked for. He's saying, I want to be twice the man in the things of God that you are. He says, you've asked a hard thing. If you see it, you'll receive it. And that was why Elijah stuck to Elijah like glue. He never left his side. So wherever he went, he was there. Even though Elijah tried to shake him off, he was really looking to see, did he have a desire for the more of God? And that request was granted because the Bible says that when Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind, he saw him and he shouted the chariots of God. He saw those chariots that came in that whirlwind and removed him into God's presence. He saw it. And the very mantle that Elijah was wearing fell to the ground. Elijah picked it up. And we need to pick up what other people don't value, what other people have let go of, what other people have left behind. And sometimes people leave behind tremendous blessings. Sometimes a person can go on to glory with an amazing ministry and it's like that ministry is now lacking in the body of Christ. That can be because no one is desiring the more of God. They're happy and content where they are and they don't want that greater walk with God, that mantle that other people carry because there's always a cost with a mantle. I believe that's why Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing. There's always a cost in carrying the anointing of God. But Elijah saw it, picked it up, embraced it, and immediately started to move in the supernatural when he had to cross the Jordan. He said, where is the Elijah of God? And struck it, and the waters departed. So immediately seeing the supernatural of God working on his behalf. So it's kingdom now. And God wants us to experience kingdom now. In fact, Jesus Christ said the kingdom of God is within you. He said it doesn't come with observation. So you're looking and thinking it's over there. No, it's not. It's over there. And that's what people do today. They see a move of God in a certain place and they think, oh, go to that place. Oh, no, this is a move going on there. We'll go to that place. But the kingdom is within you. God can encounter you in your place, the place where you're at, if you would just simply understand that. But he has got more for you. What you're experiencing right now is the tip of an iceberg. Your best days are yet to come. You might think about wonderful days in the past. I've never quite reached those heights. God is saying that your best days are yet to come, but you need to embrace the new and have a heart that says, I want that new of God. I want you to do new things in my heart, Father. Things I've never experienced. So I see things differently. 
embrace things differently and move, I operate differently than I've ever done because I'm seeking to embrace the new. So God wants us to embrace the new. Jesus made it very clear to him that has, more will be given. Because the more you get of God, the more you want of him. That should be your, your heart's desire, to have more of him. Some people just want the blessing of God and then they never pursue him again. That's a wrong attitude before God. His great desire is that you have more than you're experiencing right now. So you've got to do something, and that something is that you've got to ask for more. Father wants us to experience things that he would do for us and would do through us on an extreme level. He wants you to be extreme. Anyone who's considered extreme is someone who takes something to a different level. Some people operate on one level, but somebody takes it to the extreme, goes way above that. And God is longing to, ex to, longing to see. And I believe the world is longing to see extreme Christianity. Not this little cup hands, here comes Cadbury's type, monks walking around looking pious, but a demonstration of power. The world are tired of seeing, you know, the wet handshake vicar. They're tired of that. They need to see the extreme. Because I'll tell you something about extreme. Extreme captures the attention of those that exert, uh, observe. Always captures the attention. If you had someone who was an extreme climber and they decided to climb the Warwick Mill, you would be an audience. It's climbing up the outside with no ropes. People would gather and watch. They always watch the extreme. It draws them in. And we need an extreme type of Christianity. But in order for this to happen, there has to be a change in our mindset, the way that we think. We have to have a kingdom mindset. What would the Lord do in this situation? How would he operate in this situation? We've got to have a different mindset than the way we would normally think and the neighbor would normally respond. And we know that God's desire is to bring heaven to earth, his kingdom to be seen. That's why we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. As it is in heaven, God's will is completely obeyed in heaven. And God wants that to take place on earth and healing is his will, deliverance is his will, salvation is his will, for you to journey with the Lord is his will. So he wants us to experience all these things. The disciples walk with Jesus Christ and experience Jesus doing all these things. And Jesus even empowered them, not just the 12 but the 72, to do amazing things in his name. But the time came when Jesus told them that he was leaving. But he said, you're not going to be left alone. The comforter, he'll come. He'll come alongside you. So your advantage that I go away, it's going to benefit you, it's going to favour you for me to go because the one who's coming is exactly like me and he will empower you. And Jesus told them very clearly that they were sustained in Jerusalem to the clothed with power from on an eye. In other words, it wasn't just to go out on their own steam with enthusiasm or even good intent, but you need to have the power of God. And that's part of what the kingdom is about. Because there's many Christians that go out with good intent when on their own steam, but there's no power of God to back up what they say. They can't really meet the needs of the person because there's no power there. So Jesus is telling the disciples, you wait until you are clothed with power from an eye, and then you'll start to be my true witnesses. That there'll be a display of power. And I was saying to some of the folks just recently on Tuesday that these people in different religions that can witness. A Jehovah's Witness can witness to someone. A Mormon can witness to someone. A Muslim can witness to someone, but they can't work in the power 
that is given to the true born again believer. And so we've got to start to operate in that power and not just rely on our own steam, our own efforts, because that will wear you out completely. The disciples were used to operating with Jesus, seeing him do things. He commissioned them to do things at times. And even when he told them to do things that they didn't really understand, it was always so he would show himself on a higher level to them. You ever thought about Jesus? When he tells the disciples to cross to the other side of the lake and he stays there and prays, he's praying. He knows that when they set off sailing, they're going into a storm. So in a sense, he sent them into a storm. What happened in that storm? Jesus revealed himself. He revealed himself. And Simon Peter said, Lord, if it's you, call me to come. And Peter came and he started to walk on the water, moving the supernatural, because his eyes were focused on Jesus. The moment his eyes are taken off Jesus, the Bible says, he began to sink. He didn't just say he went under, he began to sink. There's a slowly moving down because his eyes are not on him. Whenever you take your eyes off Jesus, you will begin to sink. So Jesus took him by the hand and he walked together back to the boat and he climbed into the boat. What happened then? The Bible tells us the storm ceased. Jesus revealed himself in the storm. So he will even allow you to go through a storm so he can reveal himself to you in a greater way. And that's what we don't often see. So they could have a new encounter with Jesus. Peter walked on the water. The disciples saw that when Jesus got into the boat with them, the storm ceased. And he knew and recognised from that moment he was the son of the living God. So revelation came to them because of the storm, because of what took place. And so when we go out with the power of the Holy Spirit, it's so that we can have the supernatural edge in any situation, so that we can turn those situations around so that people would encounter Jesus. And many people today go through storms in life. You don't know what other people are going through. You look at upon the surface, but you don't really know what they're going through. You may go through something similar, but you really still don't know what they're going through. People handle things differently. And some people get overwhelmed with life issues. And Jesus Christ is the answer. So we're going to bring kingdom to them, but we've got to have that kingdom mindset where we're looking to promote the Lord Jesus Christ and make him known in every situation. We're looking to reveal Jesus Christ to a person. If they're sick, they need to know Jesus the healer. If they need provision, they need to know Jehovah Jireh, the God he provides. So they need to know that. If you're going through a, a tremendous battle or fight, you need to know Jehovah Nissan, the God of banners, the God of victory. They need to know him in those situations and they get to know him through you. So we've got to step out. The disciples, we've got to come to a period in their lives when Jesus was no longer around. They had to rely on the Holy Spirit and be empowered by him. They had to learn that. So Jesus told them, the Bible tells us in Acts 1 verse 6, it says, and when they met together, so what are the disciples doing? Meeting together with the Lord Jesus Christ. It was when they met together. It wasn't when they met on their own or when they stayed at home. It was when they met together. Many people miss out on an encounter with Jesus because they're not in the gathering. And you and I know that to be true. Thomas missed out on an encounter with a resurrected Christ because he was not in that gathering. That's why he doubted. He wasn't amongst the people where he could have been uh, strengthened and empowered and secured in his walk with the Lord. So he missed out on an appearance of the resurrected Christ because he wasn't there. So the Bible tells us, that's 1 verse 6, and when they met together, they asked him, the Lord, are you now at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Their mindset was for their nation to be restored. And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times and date. Father has set 
by his own authority. So a farmer has authority. And farmer at a time and day for the nation of Israel to be restored. Well, then Jesus said in the same breath, but you, referring to those who were there, will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That applies to us today. And you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He's telling them that God wants to restore his entire kingdom. But you need to be clothed with power from on high. And then when you're clothed with power from on high, you start to minister where you're at first in Jerusalem. Then you move on to the Judea and Samaria. Many Christians want to step over people in the street here to minister to people in another nation. Why are we stepping over people here that need to know the Lord Jesus Christ? People in the UK have just as much spiritual need than somebody in Africa or India that doesn't have a lot of material things. Because spiritually, they both been impoverished. And you can die with material wealth, you can die without it. A person can have a love of money, whether they've got money or whether they haven't got money. They all need to be saved. And Jesus is telling them, start to reveal my kingdom in Jerusalem. Start to reveal my kingdom in Samaria or Judea and then to the ends of the earth. Let it spread out. So the kingdom has to spread out. In fact, Jesus described the kingdom on one occasion as being like a tree that branches spread out. Birds of the air, other creatures came and took shelter under those branches. God wants his kingdom to spread out so it covers people around us. But it has to happen through you and me wanting more than what we've got right now. One of the great dangers in the Christian church is that we tend to settle down, become comfortable. You ever wanted to go out somewhere and you know you need to go? You sat on the couch, you had a five minute snooze, you're nice and snug. You don't really want to go out then, do you? Well, that's really a picture of what the church is like at times. It's settled for what? It's got to become comfortable. And I don't believe that God wants us to be settlers. He wants us to be pioneers, visionaries, that move out with the gospel, that look for ways of presenting the gospel under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And allow him to work through us, not say, well, I've got this good idea, and make him do it, but step out. And sometimes that might mean you doing something you have never done before. You see, you've all heard messages, haven't you, about stepping out of your comfort zone. Peter got out of the boat in the midst of a storm, but his eyes were fixed on Jesus. And maybe sometimes God wants you to get out of the boat. Maybe sometimes God wants you to step out, even though it's storms all around you, you just simply focus on Jesus and start to move to do something for him you've never done before. Maybe you've never prayed for somebody that you've just met. He may want you to do that. Start to step out. If he asks you to do it, or prompted you to do it, we've got to be people that are obedient to that and not back down from it. Whatever he asks you to do, he will always equip you to do. When the disciples sailed into that storm, Jesus Christ knew everything they needed to still that storm was within them. Within them. They'd just seen the feeding of the 5,000 men. That's probably double, treble the amount that was fed. They'd just experienced that. And maybe Jesus wanted them to, to know that God is the God of the miraculous and to trust him in that storm. Everything you will ever need in life, it gives to you. Everything you ever face, it gives you the ability to go through it with him. You are never alone. So when he asks you to do something that's new to you and your little heart is beating, You've got to lean upon him and trust him. 
when he tells you to share something and you think, well, I'm not very good at speaking or sharing anything, you've got to be willing to share whatever he lays upon your heart. You've got to have a confidence in him and a confidence in the gifting he's given you. And why I say that, I'm not saying put your faith in the gifting, I'm saying put your faith in God and what he has given you. You've got to have faith, if you like, in the tools or the instruments of ministry that he's given you, in the gifting that he's given you. If you know confidence in the gifting, how are you going to operate in it? A man who's a builder, a bricklayer, has confidence in the tools he's using, his bricking hammer, the trowel that he's using. He do not go to Poundland and buy one from there. He gets a proper quality one that he knows is going to last and is reliable. And he's got confidence in the tools he's using. As you grow in confidence with God, you'll have confidence in the things that he's given you and not going to fail. You've got to trust in him in those areas and start to step out. How do you do that? If you're in the meeting and you feel that God has given you a word and it's a now word for that meeting, you then start to release it. He may have just given you a, a word, not a sentence, a word. And you've got to release that and trust it for the next words to come. So there's a tongue and then there's an interpretation needed. He might just give you a word or a couple of words and you've got to trust the Lord to bring the next. But you've got to open your mouth, do it, and then it will flow. And you know what? You go away from that meeting knowing that God has used you and you feel 10 foot tall. More confident because he's training you to do stuff. You've got to start to step out. And Jesus Christ was interested in the nations here in the Word of God that we've read about tonight. And he wanted the disciples to understand he wasn't just restoring Israel. He's looking to restore the entire world, to restore people to himself, people. But he was using certain people to do that. And the great thing is, is that some of these great men that we see in the Word of God, we sometimes look at and think, well, they were almost like extraordinary men. They were normal men. They trusted in an extraordinary God. Elijah, the Bible says, was a man of like passions. In other words, he's exactly like you and me. He wasn't of some special calibre. He was someone who yielded to the Lord. That's what made him special in God's sight. He simply yielded to the Lord, an ordinary man that yielded to the living God. And we need to do exactly the same. And I'm saying that if you start to do that, you determine in your heart to do that, it will revolutionise your life. You will start to have dreams, you will start to have visions, you will start to get words from him because he knows he can trust you to release them and to act upon them. He will start to give you opportunities where a sick person will come your way because he knows when the girl at the checkout says, I'm really rough today, you will pray. And if you really get God's favour, you get shopping for free. No, you pray for them. And that's what God is looking for us to step out in that, those ways. He's looking for us to, to think, you know, people used to say this all the time, think outside of the box. Don't be limited to the way that you normally think or the way people around you think. Think the way that God wants you to think. And we've got to be like that in our walk and our life before him, that if he shows us something he's doing, they've never done it before, never said it before, we've got to be, be willing to be used of him to do that and then God will do great things. So you read in the word of God of people taking spiritual journeys. Like you talk in most circles about that and you think, you know, you know, you're off you're off the starship enterprise, you, you know, they, they, they think you're peculiar. But it's in the word of God. God does supernatural things. God multiplies things where there's a need. 
would we be in situations to just say, oh, there's only so many you can be fed and turn the others away? Or would we stop and say, look, we're going to pray over this food and expect the miracle of God? That's the mindset that God wants us to have. When we have that mindset, when we have that belief, things would start to change. So we've not got to settle for what we've got. It's in the place of blessing we ask for more. And people might think, isn't that being ungrateful? No, it's not, because God says, ask for more. He desires to meet the hungry heart. Even the psalmist says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. As the watchman waits for the dawn, he's waiting for the morning to come. We've got to look out for the Lord, expect him to come. A watchman at night will know that the morning is going to follow. It's going to come. And we've got to expect these great things of God. And I'm saying that God has great things in store for you. You might think, well, it's just little old me. No, it's little old you and the great big Holy Spirit that lives within you. And he just wants to get out and show you that if you rely on him, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You see, sometimes... In the church we have people that can do one thing and I don't believe that should ever be the case because the Bible says of the Lord Jesus Christ he did all things well and so God doesn't just want you to master in one area not be able to do anything else he wants you to do all things well but it comes through yielding to him so that you're willing to step up in any situation what would you do if someone just came to you just as the meeting was starting and said, look, can you come and testify for five minutes at the front? Could you come and pray? Could you just come and share a word? What do you think God's been saying to you? What would you do? Well, well, I've never done that before. Exactly, it's new. That's what God is saying. It's new. The new basically means you've never done it before. You've never seen it before. You've never experienced it before. But the moment you're obedient to God and you're reliant upon God, <coughs> it starts to kick in in your life in a tremendous way. He wants kingdom to be now, to, to be demonstrated. You know, the disciples had to learn many things because if you're not in ministry from Jesus, the Bible tells us on one occasion, they're ministering for the Lord Jesus Christ and they said, Jesus, we saw this guy and he's casting out demons in your name. But he said, but he's not one of us. And the disciples, you know, really weren't too happy that this guy wasn't one of them. He was doing it different than the way that they'd been taught. He wasn't one of their particular group. But there's no exclusiveness on the things of God. He wants us to all drink from the same river and move in the same way. But Jesus says, don't stop him because they were stopping him ministering. She said, don't stop him. Because anyone that's proclaiming Jesus, acknowledging Jesus as Lord, isn't in the next breath going to be cursing him. And he says, if anyone does a miracle in my name. So he's referring to deliverance as being a miracle. Everybody wants to be used of God to move in miracles, but no one wants to pray for the guy or the woman that needs deliverance. It's a miracle. Like Jesus said, it's not only a miracle deliverance, it's a demonstration of kingdom. Jesus says, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, know this, the kingdom of God has come upon you. So it's a demonstration of the kingdom now. Kingdom now. And we've got to get away from this mindset that kingdom is a place we go into. That's the kingdom of heaven. But we're within the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God needs to expand. The power, the signs and wonders, the journeys he wants to take you on. The encounters with him he wants you to experience. All those new things will lead you into greater, a greater walk with him and have a greater effectiveness in the land. The disciples would not be effective 
without the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And it was the start of sharing the word of God where they were and then expand from there. And it would do us good to do the same today. People want to share the word of God where they're not known. You want to preach in a different town because of, well, I don't want my neighbours seeing me or my school friends. What, what's wrong with you? We need to proclaim the word of God where we're at. I have people come to me and say, oh, it's People in the gym say, oh, I saw you, I might not know him. I saw you uh, speaking on the street. You've got an opportunity now, because they saw me, they've heard me for a period of time out there on the street. And they've not been opposed because they've come to talk to you about it. And you start to share the word of God. Yeah. But other people say, oh, such a body said, they speak, they, you heard you speaking on the street, and he was, he was quite impressed. So, and, and you're thinking to yourself, well, they've talked about you to other people. So the gospel is getting out. Don't just preach where you're at. If you can preach in your own town, you can preach anywhere. We're not to be fearful because somebody passes us who we know. If you like them to you, you've got a mic, haven't you? You can just be led of the Spirit to say what you want. Don't be faithful of people. Share where you're at. Jesus told the disciples to do the same. But to do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is one of the major problems today. Is people preaching up on the street but there's no demonstration of power. There's nothing to separate them from any other person preaching a religious message that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. But what gives them the edge is the supernatural power of God. I'll pray for you right now and God will heal you. I'll pray for you right now and you feel the presence of the power of God. You're going to be bold enough to do that because you're not taking a chance on yourself. You're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been on platforms in Africa and I've told the people, if God doesn't heal you tonight, we'll go on. We'll go on. And that's, you think, why would you say something like that? The people respond and Jesus Christ heals them. Because I know it isn't about you, it's about Jesus. And you've got to be obedient to him and have a confidence in him that he will do the things you ask. And people come out with what the world will see the most difficult problems. But I know that God doesn't have a, a chart with degrees of difficulty on in heaven. He doesn't mark it off every day and say I'm working towards that one. A couple more weeks, Michael will be able to get that. He doesn't do that. He's got the power. And he's looking for you to step out and to reach out. You might say, well, I've only been a Christian for so long. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. People receive Christ and they start to operate in the supernatural of God immediately. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. He wants you to move in that particular way. And I'm saying that we're going to be living that kingdom life. It's that sort of life that will start to attract people in. That you represent Jesus, you represent him well. You just seek to make Jesus Christ known. And to minister into people's life the way that you totally believe that Jesus Christ would. And God will bless you in abundant way. Let's pray tonight. If you want prayer tonight, and you just want to say to yourself, look, I want to step out in the things of God. I want to encounter you. I want to be able to do new things for you. It will give you those opportunities to do new things. You've just got to be obedient with him. It's how you step out. Peter had to step out of the boat. He had to trust that he could walk on that water. He had to put his feet out. I don't see the other disciples doing that. Peter did. Just step out and trust him. And then... The supernatural comes in. You always want it first so you can, you know, feel confident to step out. Let him be your confidence. Let's pray right now. Father, I thank you that your word does tell us that you are our confidence. And I pray we would allow you to be our confidence in every situation that when we challenged, when we stretched, that we'd be willing to be obedient to you. That we would share the good news of the kingdom 
And Father, not only share the good news of the kingdom, but demonstrate kingdom now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Lord, your kingdom will operate and work through to produce the very things that are in heaven. No sickness in heaven, Father God. There's no demons floating around there. I just simply pray we would realize that we can operate under the influence of your Holy Spirit to eradicate those things out of people's lives. And I pray we would step out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in every way it might be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.